I love how you just laid it out for us really clearly where we are on this journey, uh, but also like what do we mean when we talk about AI, right? Like how many different versions of AI are we uh, applying and, and, and talking through? And so I hope everyone is, is walking away with a little bit more clarity about how to talk about it with your organizations as well. Um, I want to remind everyone, um, open up the app, ask questions, submit your Q&As there, um, but also don't be shy. We have mics um, going throughout the room, so uh, just raise your hand high and they will find you and, and come, come uh, get your questions. I know you all want to be able to pick Sanjay's brain, right? Um, so, but to, to start out, you know, I know everyone's on this different path, right? Like hearing so transparently about where you guys are on this, on this trajectory. What would you recommend for folks who are really just starting out? Where, where's that starting point, that first step? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things. I mean, I mean ultimately, you, you want to implement this technology. I mean, there's investment that's required to make AI true, right? I mean, I think, you know, ultimately, the question is, is do you have the right use cases and do you have that right business sponsorship? Because AI is not just a, it's not a technology project, it's a business project, it's a transformational business project, right? So, you know, when we think about the tops down, bottoms up use case, this means that in your organization, you're gonna have a whole bunch of people who have ideas of, hey, I can use this to optimize this thing that I do. You're gonna have executives being like, we want generative AI, we want more generative AI, right? And so, you know, ultimately the question is, what is that use case that you're trying to, to drive? And I really think that that portfolio view is like super an interesting way of doing it, because you guys, many of you probably already have some level of AI capability in your organization today, right? And as I mentioned you know, in, the, in the closing of, of my remarks, some of those systems are totally fine the way they are. They perform based on how you expect them to be. They are deterministic, and this is actually an important part to, to think about, um, you know, about generative AI systems themselves and deep learning systems is this notion of deterministic versus non-deterministic systems. What does that mean? It means certain use cases, the system actually has to be explainable. Right? And that means that the system, based on like a, an algorithm, based on an input that you give it and the output that you give it, it has to be able, you have to be able to understand why that output happened. Right? And this is needed for all sorts of types of safety systems. There might be places where you have regulation, where essentially there's laws that say you cannot have a black box algorithm that you don't understand how it works. The fact is, a lot of these large language models, they are not explainable. Right? They're not deterministic. And that essentially means is that you give it an input, you get an output, you can't go in there like you would in traditional code and put a bunch of breakpoints or have output debugging and understand, oh, that's why this credit application got rejected, mm -hmm. right? And so there's constraints that you have to think about in terms of what are those use cases that make sense? How do you align them to the most important business priorities? And then ultimately when you tackle it, how do you take it bit by bit by bit, right? And, and what I worry about with AI in general is that everything becomes an AI use case, even though it doesn't need to be an AI use case. Everything becomes a generative AI, generative AI use case when it shouldn't be. And then ultimately the, the, the technology IT teams get held to like deliver on like an, like an unachievable promise, mm -hmm. right? And, and this is just something that I think we have to be cautious about is this technology is incredibly powerful. It's still in its early days. Pick your battles wisely. Make sure you have that business sponsorship uh, and then start small. I love that. Start small, yeah. and it's that hammer in the nail problem, right? Like, just because you have AI doesn't mean you have to apply it, right? Like, sometimes it's not the, the best solution. Um, so, walking the floors last night, you know, I, I was talking to a bunch of different customers, and you all are, you know, keeping the trains running. You are running HVACs for aquariums. You are uh, supporting the health uh, health of patients with HIV and AIDS. Apparently, you are also uh, working on repurposing cadavers, somebody out there. Um, so lots of use cases. Um, what, you know, so much of the AI conversation gets so theoretical, right? So what are some examples, real world, that, that you love that are really compelling and really showcasing uh, how this is working? Yeah, and, and let me take something maybe outside of CDW um, that I think are super interesting. There's, there's a ton of innovation happening in what I would say the manufacturing kind of space of how do you make manufacturing like more efficient. And a lot of this has to do with taking the data that's being created from all these connected systems now. You've heard about IoT. Everything's now connected to the internet. So you get all this like really great, rich diagnostic data coming off these devices and then building these models that can do prediction, both whether it's coming from maintenance or increasing productivity or yield, I think is super interesting. I, I actually have the opportunity of um, being an advisor for a program at Northwestern's Kellogg uh, 
School of Business called MBAI. So it's a combination of AI plus MBA. And they did a project last year with John Deere. Um, and the project essentially was modifying the blower within one of their harvesting machines to increase the yield of their crop, mm. right? And so you have these connected vehicles, these harvester combines, collecting all this data. You understand essentially um, the density of what's being sucked off off the, the ground, and then there's essentially a blower that blows. And so using historical data that they've been collecting for seasons and seasons, they can optimally tune based on the humidity, based on the weather, based on um, the density of what's being picked up, and they were able to increase food yields by 15%, right? I mean, these are, this is like real world, like helping the world become a better place, like right? using this technology and using it to optimize these closed systems. So like that's, that's, a, that's not a generative AI use case, right? That's like actually a logistic, a logistic model that they created, mm -hmm. right? Using a couple MBA students and a couple masters in computer science students. So like there are real opportunities here where AI can be transformative, but not necessarily the generative AI use mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we've got a question, we've got lots of, lots of questions, so you guys are very curious, I, know, I love that. Um, so how would you approach uh, employees who are scared that AI will replace their jobs, and uh, those who maybe refuse to adopt for that reason? Oof, yeah, the refuse to adopt, that's a tough mm -hmm. one. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of, of, of fear and kind of maybe misunderstanding of what this technology can do today. Uh, I do think in the long term, there will be some kind of view of how much and how far can this automate. Um, I think with the technology today, it's not very good at doing a lot of what I would say um, important decision making. And that's where kind of where our brains are, is that when there's like a real critical business decision, life and death situation, product decision, strategy decision, AI is not there to be able to do that. Uh, there are certain areas of the organization that I think are, are more ripe for automation than not. Take the call center, for example, right? If you can automate parts of a call center or um, you know, customer service, I think generative AI can actually do a fairly good um, job of optimizing that type of organization, so you might need less people to do it. Not mean, doesn't mean that you don't need any people, but you need less people. Um, so you know, I think the, 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 the common wisdom now that I'm, that I'm hearing in the industry is that, at least in the near term, it's not AI that will kind of replace humans. It'll be humans who understand AI that will replace humans who don't, right? So I think that's gonna be the, the thing that we'll see with those folks that refuse to adopt within an organization. Um, you know, I think that's with, any, with every technology. You know, I think there's certainly people that refuse to use a personal computer when the enterprise deployed them, right? Said, I'd, I'd rather do it with my pen and paper, right? And at some point, the business model doesn't make sense anymore, right? And you have to then figure out how to retrain and replace those. So I, I do see this kind of progression of AI today being a good time saver and helping optimize kind of people's time. You know, I use it to, you know, summarize a long email, right? And it saves me, you know, 40, 50 seconds. But, you know, you kind of compound that and now you have a big time saver productivity enhancement. But then I think piece by piece, we're gonna see more disruption in certain industries where the technology gets good enough to reduce the need for humans to be involved in a lot of cases. Like I said, it doesn't mean that you completely get rid of them, but instead of having 100 call center reps, maybe you need 10, right? Um, and the AI takes care of most of those other kind of easier cases. Well, it's ultimately that partner uh, position, right? It's not about replacement. It's, it's about leaving the humans to do the, the important and interesting yeah. work, right? And we think about this internally at CDW is how does technology become the superpower for our coworkers, mm. right? So, mm. you know, my mission is not how does technology replace everybody? It's how does it become that superpower um, in order for them to be more effective, you know, and be able to do those things that are higher cognitive level, which are, I'm gonna solve a really hard problem that's kind of new to the world. I wanna have that customer intimacy. I wanna work on new solutions. Less, hey, I'm trying to push kind of paper from one part of my organization to another. That could be automated. So last question for you, and I, this is, you know, you have, you have a tough job, right? Like you, you are looking at the forefront, you are uh, being accountable for risk and, and kind of reporting to the board on both sides of the, of the coin, right? So how do you keep that balance and how do you kind of, you know, look on that long-term risk and also uh, keep excited about, about these opportunities? Yeah, no, I, I, it is, uh, it's, a, it's a fun job and, and I'm honored to have the job. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a bit of, of educating um, the executives ed ed educating the board of directors if you have one right around what this technology is and what it isn't you know I think you can often go chasing shiny objects um, and then ultimately uh, under 
underachieve when it comes to the expectations of the organization. I think that's always kind of as the technologist, like there's always this belief that technology can, can easily change things. Um, what I would say is that with any technology application, it's a combination of deploying the technology, but also having the right business buy-in and changing the business processes themselves, right? And that's something that um, I'm excited about doing at CDW is not only do I get to build new technology, deploy new platforms, but working hand in hand with the business side to say, hey, this thing that you used to do that took 10 steps, let's redesign it to do two steps. And by the way, now the technology can actually automate one of them, right? And so it's a combination of the tops down business buy-in, redesigning these processes and then bringing the right technology. What I would caution, and this is something that, that I'm always cognizant of, is that it doesn't become just a, a tech transformation, yes. right? It's a technology and business transformation that happen in parallel um, and so, you know, one of the things that I'm grateful with is, you know, Jill Billhorn, I think she's here, um, is, is a tremendous partner of mine from the sales side, mm -hmm. right? So she's coming and saying, hey, here are the problems we're having from a sales perspective, you know, here are the challenges that we have. And then, you know, my team is coming in saying, okay, let's take the technology and figure out how we meet in the middle, mm -hmm. right? It's not just a, hey, deploy me a tool um, and we're, we're good to go. It's really this larger scale transformation. Um, so that's how I'm balancing it and just like tempering the expectation of the organization, celebrating the small wins and then ultimately, how do you enable that hub and spoke model where you're driving innovation to the edges of the organization, where IT technology becomes kind of that central hub to enable, uh, to govern, and to help uh, educate and promote those advancements. Fantastic. Well, everyone, thank you for, uh, let, let's give a round of applause for Sanjay.